In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to each and every one of you on this hot Sunday. And we're feeling it in the building right now. They didn't have air conditioning when they built this place, as I had to explain once to a bride. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for being here and for sharing in this service, not only those of you uh, in the building, but also those of you who are watching at home live or at a later time during the week. Your presence lifts us as well. Our call to worship. Come, let us worship our God with joy and thanksgiving. Everything in us says thank you. At worship in this sacred place, we say it again, thank you for your love and for your faithfulness. When earth's rulers hear what you have to say, O God, they'll sing of what you've done, how great the glory of God. Finish what you started in us, God. Your love is eternal. Stay with us now that we may say thank you. Let us pray. Faithful God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving, deeply grateful for the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown toward us, your people. When we call out to you, you answer. When we are exhausted, you give us the strength to go on. When we find ourselves in trouble, you are there, standing beside us. So we come before you in gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts and the worship of our lives. Open our eyes to see and know you here among us. Open our ears to recognize your voice, and then send us out from here to live and work in the world as your faithful disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. One of the Interesting things that's happened during the pandemic when it comes to worship is that we're hearing new music and most of us are so familiar with the songs that we've heard over the course of our lives, some insisting those are the only songs that we should sing. This is an opportunity to learn and hear new ones as well. So this is a hymn from More Voices called Who Is My Mother, sung by Roland Gallant and played by Laura Lee Carrier. That was too close. (laughs) Who is my mother? Who is my brother? All those who gather round Jesus Christ, spirit blown people born from the gospel. Sit at the table round Jesus Christ. Differently abled, differently labeled, widen the circle round Jesus Christ. Crutches and stigmas, cultures, enigmas, all come together round Jesus Christ. Love will relate us, color or status, can't segregate us round Jesus Christ. Family failings, human derailings, all are accepted round Jesus Christ. Bound by one vision, met for one mission, we claim each other round Jesus Christ. Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred and spirit through Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you. You're awake now. (laughs) And we apologize to those of you listening on your headphones. Our call to offering is taken from 2 Corinthians. St. Paul writes of confidence in the power of God revealed in the resurrection of Jesus that must underlie a life of faithfulness and generosity. I believed and so I spoke. Today we believe and we give with generosity of our time and resources that God's goodness may be known in this world. Generous God, take our gifts this day and use them so that we may be part of your great work throughout the world. Through our giving, bring justice and love closer to all, not just in our community, but in the world beyond these walls, strengthening our church and the whole United Church of Canada so that we grow together each day into a powerful voice for healing and peace. Amen. Invite Roland Gallant to read Psalm 138. morning. I'll be reading Psalm 38. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Thank you, Roland. This is a reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first binding up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. 
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Each summer for three years, when I was a student minister, I would go and serve as a cadet chaplain for the air cadets in Greenwood, or the sea cadets, at the base in Cornwallis, Nova Scotia. It was interesting being with the air cadets because they trained on an active base and I saw all kinds of planes. It was just as interesting to me being at Cornwallis with the sea cadets because the base had just been deemed surplus and had been largely abandoned, including blocks and blocks of military housing. I once convinced a guard to let me into the chapel, which had since been made redundant, to see the windows and to see a military chapel. In Greenwood, when it's hot, you can feel the heat on the pavement, and it usually comes to about here. And if it's that bad, the base shuts down. I much preferred being with the sea cadets on the water. It was a lot cooler. There were lots of things that happened during camp. It was expected that the Roman Catholic, Baptist, Anglican, and United Church chaplains would do certain things, like Padre's Hour, which was religious instruction for the kids. We led prayers at the parades, and we often got to know the officers because we were considered one of them, and therefore we had rooms near theirs. Trust me, on a Friday night, the last thing you want to see is chaplains, so we socialized elsewhere. It was our role to inform cadets from all over the Atlantic provinces if there had been a death at home, or help arrange for a young person to go back home if things weren't working out. We dealt with a lot of homesickness, and we learned about the home lives of kids who were finally out of an environment that was abusive and could speak in a safe place. Being a padre was rewarding work for me as I loved getting to know the young people and getting to know my counterparts. One day, the Roman Catholic seminarian suggested we should go to a worship service being led by the local evangelical church for the cadets. He was fairly conservative himself and felt it would be an opportunity for us to attend since the Baptist minister had arranged it. What I saw shocked my little United Church soul. I saw people speaking in tongues, rolling on the floor. I saw a light show with Satan clawing unsaved teenagers from accidents as people screamed. And I had to suppress my anger when I watched cadets fleeing from the worship space crying. Since it was my instinct to care for them as a group had assembled outside the building, they said to me, Aaron, you have to stop this. They were right. Before the service ended, I took the microphone and told those gathered cadets that I was going outside and there was a group of cadets already out there and since this wasn't my experience of God or Jesus, anyone feeling upset or uncomfortable who wanted to come outside with me and the others could. And they did by the droves. The question as we followed up after the service between the four chaplains asking one another um, after seeing uh, people speaking in tongues and rolling on the ground, these previously ordinary people like you and I, was, was this of the Holy Spirit or was it something else? The Catholic chaplains were convinced that this was in the something else category as they believed the Holy Spirit to be gentle. And this was anything but. The Baptist was shocked because he loved it and thought it gave praise to God. And when they looked at me for my opinion, I said to my Protestant counterpart, sorry, I'm with Rome on this one. This is the question of what is happening in Mark's gospel today. Jesus has returned to the house where he had been staying, and it says that the crowds disrupted the meal. And at this point in Mark's story, Jesus has healed a man in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He has followed the crowds for his, by the, he's been followed by the crowds for his teachings. He has appointed people to be his disciples. And then it says he returned home. And all these things have caused a commotion. That Jesus being confronted on two sides by his family and by the officials from Jerusalem who have come to press charges. His family say he is out of his mind and the authorities said that he is of the devil. And these scribes from Jerusalem interrupt the confrontation that he's having with his family, who at this point leave for Nazareth, as they're in Capernaum. In anthropological studies of demon possession in traditional societies, it is noted that it is common for those in power to dispute or discredit those who assume positive, active roles, such as Jesus' exorcisms. 
Witchcraft accusations represent a distancing strategy which seeks to discredit, in this case, Jesus and sever links with the community because it assumes that the one who controls the spirits is suspected of causing what they cure. The scribes themselves believe themselves to be God's representatives. And because Jesus was at odds with them, his allegiance must be elsewhere. To borrow a phrase from our not-too-distant history, he's being labeled a communist. The scribes use a euphemism for Satan. The first is Beelzebub, and then an obscure name that probably derived from a Hebrew expression about aboding or dwelling. The name means Lord of the dwelling, referring to the possessed in whom he dwells. And Jesus responds, not with anger, but with a parable. Normally, parables are meant to be for those with ears to hear, so it's important that we hear what he has to say, even though it's kind of cryptic. His defense becomes an offense as he turns to those accusing him of being the devil, turns their words back on them and says, how can Satan exercise Satan? Should a kingdom be divided against itself? That kingdom cannot stand. What Jesus is saying is that Satan cannot clean out his own house. It's up to Jesus to lead the revolt against the powers to bring their rule to an end. To quote Mark's gospel, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless the strong man is first bound and his house can be plundered. It's foreshadowing. Goods refers to utensils that were used in the home or in the fields, things that were used in war and in peace in the secular world and in the sacred world. Binding the strong man is the reference to exorcism, referring to a demon that no one had the strength to hold And it refers also to the political imprisonment of of John the Baptist and later Jesus and Barabbas. The foreshadowing is when Jesus speaks of this, we know it will happen to him too. And Mark has come clean. Jesus is the stronger one who intends to overthrow the reign of the strong man, who in this case is the scribal establishment represented by the demon. It's a prophecy from Isaiah that God is making good on the promise to liberate those who are the prey of the strong and rescue the captives from the tyrants. But there's a serious statement left to be made when you mistake the work of the Holy Spirit for that of Satan. Scripture scholar Juan Luis Segundo says, what is not pardonable is using theology to turn real human liberation into something that deserves scorn. The real sin against the Holy Spirit is refusing to recognize with joy the liberation that is taking place before one's very eyes. This is what the scribes can't see. So that when Jesus has stopped talking, he's turned the tables on the scribes and says it is they who are aligned against God's purposes. To be captive to the way things are, to resist criticism and change, to brutally suppress efforts at humanizing people, it is to be bypassed by the grace of God itself. When you live for the law and not for liberation. A few paragraphs back in Mark's gospel, when Jesus healed the man with the the withered hand in the synagogue and on the Sabbath, he did it in full view of the authorities who said it was wrong. As opposed to the man's healing and liberation, it's the very work of God. Mark ends this section by Going back to the family crisis in the house, the story opens when those belonging to him thought he was deranged. In Cape Breton, you'd say he was beside himself. And they tried, Jesus' family tried to get him to stop it. His family tried to get him, uh, 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 seize him. It's a word used elsewhere in Mark for b- political detainment. At the end of this section, his family now include his mother and his brothers and sisters who are outside the house summoning him. And we have to have sympathy with them because they're doing what they're doing because they knew what happened to people who stood up to the powers that be and to the authorities. He was courting disaster and they were trying to protect him and maybe even their family reputation. There were crosses lined along the streets in Jerusalem as a reminder to those who stood against the authorities, don't you dare. And that's when Jesus goes in against the societal expectation that you don't go against your family. It's it's called kinship. It's where you drew your prospects. It's where you were given your vocation. It's who you socialize with, your kin. It was the backbone of that society, and Jesus is overturning it by saying, those who are inside where Jesus are are his real brothers and sisters and mother because they're doing the will of God. This is a big discussion in Bible study as it seemed to go against honoring your father and mother, that commandment. And as much as his family feel alienated by Jesus, he feels alienated by them and refuses to see them. 
if someone said that my mother and brother were outside and wanted to see me, I might be a little bit scared too. So if they can't accept his vocation, he cannot recognize their kindredness. So Mark gives us a new concept of family. When you can't be recognized for who you are by your family, God gives you a new one. So people have to do that sometimes. And this idea of family is one that we use in church, that we are the whole family of God. Some people have to do that in life and walk away from the ones they love so that they can live their authentic lives, which is some of the theme of Pride Week. And as we discover in these times, especially in this 96th anniversary of the United Church of Canada, we who are the church, we have to wonder who we were versus who we're going to be. And we have to determine here and now what is of the Holy Spirit and what is not, especially as we live into the horrors of the aftermath of residential schools and the victims of Kamloops, BC, even as as it's becoming clear there will be more, many more across Canada. We're part of that system and now we are part of the ongoing work of reconciliation. And you know, there's still a narrative out there that says there were good people doing good things in that system, almost as a way of trying to justify the schools which were in and of themselves wrong. It's not so long ago that a soon-to-be-retired Canadian conservative senator argued that residential schools did a lot of good for First Nations children, and then the people that worked in them were well-intentioned. Then she went on to post on her Senate website racist letters of support from people who agreed with her. How, in the name of God, can you justify the physical, cultural, and spiritual abuse of that system? Especially a white senator is beyond me. What Jesus says to us speaks to the power of the gospel. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The residential school system was not the will of God. It was the will of a colonial system that sought to impose its own values and destroy the culture of people living here long before white settlers stepped foot in this land. And now we live into these truths, there will be a reckoning. The veil is lifting. Truth is being revealed. And we are seeing the realm of God more and more as it was meant to be, and less as those in power seek it to be. This is a prayer that I found um, for the 96th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. It is written by the Reverend Dr. Janet Gear, professor at Vancouver School of Theology. Let us pray. Here we are, gracious God, gathered as your people on this 96th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. Here we are joining generations who have worshiped in, shared the mission of, and cherished this denomination before us. Some of us know you through scripture and exploring your word. Some of us understand you through a close relationship with Jesus, your son. Some of us discover you in the community we form together. Some of us find you as we serve others. Some of us know your presence as we seek justice and right relations in this world. Some of us discover you in the stillness of prayer and contemplation. Many ways to know you, many ways to serve you, many gifts you have given to each of us for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ. Together, we are known as the United Church of Canada. Thank you, O God, for this gift. Amen. Our closing hymn is We Are Pilgrims.
Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping, when you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Brother, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. For those of you who don't know, Roland Gallant is the chair of our church council, and he's also a member of our choir, so we thank the leadership that he offers to our church, both uh, in meetings but also in music. So thank you, Roland, for today. And also I want to uh, thank Laura Lee Carrier, who is a member of our choir, who recently joined St. John's, and will be our church musician for the summer months as we worship together. Thank you. We'd like to remind you again that we'll be exiting the sanctuary today with our ushers, and we ask that you remain seated until an usher comes and indicates that the exit is clear and it's safe to leave. Imagine if everyone at Heinz get up at the same time and left. So we're trying to prevent that. So just a, we'll do a distant exit of a distanced exit of the building. So just wait, stay seated until an usher comes to get you. Now, go into the world with assurance, hope and promise. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest upon you and even unsettle you. The love of God, creator and giver of life, embrace you and even confront you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit encourage you and surprise you this day and in all your days. Amen.